uh, at 12.15. Okay, so I've just hit recording, so we're now being recorded. Um, all right, so uh, let me, I'm just going to do a quick introduction to humanities informatics. Uh, hello, my name is Jack Chen. I teach in the East Asian Languages, Literatures, and Cultures Department, and I'm co-director of the Humanities Informatics Lab with Dan, uh, Devjani Ganguly and Alison Both Booth, who are both here today. I am pleased to welcome everyone to the first of the Humanities Informatics Lab final showcase panels, which marks the end of the three-year lab. This panel is organized by the Human Machine Intelligence Group, which is led by Paul Humphreys of the Philosophy Department and Vicente Ordonez Ramon of Computer Science. HMI has been one of the great success stories of our lab, creating and sustaining a vibrant intellectual community that does true interdisciplinary work. HMI will continue its work this year following the end of the lab's funding. I'd like to thank the Strategic Investment Fund, the Institute of the Humanities and Global Culture, and all of you, especially, for the collaborative work that you're done, you've done and will continue to do. So at this point, I will turn things over to Paul Humphreys, who will introduce the speakers. Thank you. Hi, um, I, I'm Paul Humphreys from Philosophy, and uh, it's very nice to see some familiar faces out there. Um, I, uh, I really am so happy with how successful, you know, the humanities and machine, in, uh, sorry, the human and machine intelligence group, group has been. It's, it's been successful beyond my uh, wildest expectations. And I would like to thank the Humanities Informatics Lab and uh, Devjani Ganguly and Alison Booth and Jack Chen for their support, both financially and uh, in, in intellectually. Um, and also to Vicente for being just such a, such a great co-director. Um, if you, if anybody's watching would like to learn more about it, just Google human and machine intelligence and uh, we have a website there with a lot of information. So our first uh, speaker is Ashley Deeks from UVA Law School and I'll turn things over to her. Great, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for tolerating a lawyer in this group. I uh, feel like a little bit of an interloper uh, by virtue of my uh, deep lack of technological expertise, but uh, it, this has been a very, very um, edifying group uh, for me to participate in. And I hope to continue to, to be a part of whatever comes next. So uh, just as a, a quick background to what I wanna talk about today, um, one of the uh, most salient debates today uh, in international law, and uh, in particular, sort of the international law that regulates military operations, is this question about lethal autonomous weapon systems, uh, often referred to as killer robots, derogatorily referred to that way. Um, but uh, we're not there yet in terms of the militaries, Russia's military, China's. Uh, it may well be we're all kind of working that direction. This is this idea of, of producing a, a system that can go out onto the battlefield and uh, identify targets and decide to use potentially lethal force against them. There is some automaticity, some autonomy that exists uh, on the battlefield today short of that. And so one of the things I wanted to start to do in my work um, is to think about these areas in which the military is going to be employing artificial intelligence or more specifically machine learning to improve its decision making. Uh, and in, in two areas in particular that I've kind of bear down on this, one is in detention decisions and one is in targeting decisions. Who are they actually going to use force against? Um, so I wrote a paper that actually starts out somewhere different. It starts with a, a discussion about criminal justice and our, our, our criminal justice system, which has started to deploy predictive algorithms, um, algorithms that at this point seem kind of short of machine learning, but are, are headed more into the, uh, to the learning space. And these algorithms do two things. One is they help our, our governments, federal, state, local, assess how dangerous people are. And the other is they also recommend to police departments where these departments should go out on patrol uh, based on predictions of where crime is going to occur. So uh, I'll say a little bit about those algorithms and then I'll turn to the US military and, and basically argue that the military faces similar conceptual challenges that they need to predict how dangerous people are and where future violence is most likely to happen. Uh, and then I'll just say a little bit about some of the criminal justice critiques. Uh, many of them may be familiar to you and how those critiques should inform our military 
as it starts to think about adopting these tools. So I'll start with these criminal justice uh, use of predictive algorithms. So they're using algorithms to um, try to make more objective judgments about who to keep in custody and try to make uh, more ef efficient decisions about where to patrol cities, neighborhoods, and so on. So on the individual dangerousness front, where this comes up is, for example, in decisions about uh, bail, whether to let somebody who's been arrested go out on bail before they are uh, tried. Or in sentencing, uh, should the, is this someone we should a sentence for a short period of time or actually a really long period of time? It also comes up in bail decisions. Um, and in each case, you have a government decision maker who's trying to assess how long uh, to retain somebody in custody based on imperfect information. Uh, so effectively trying to decide if somebody is going to re-engage in a criminal act if they're released. So uh, we've started to see these algorithms uh, develop that are trained on lots of data about people, including age, gender, employment history, family history, uh, and past criminal history. And then the algorithms are presented with an individual case that it's never seen before, somebody who's just been arrested. And the, the algorithm will predict how likely it is, basically putting people in buckets, uh, that somebody will com commit a crime if released. The second category of criminal justice algorithms is sometimes referred to in the bucket of predictive policing. So uh, these are decisions that the police make based on algorithmic recommendations about where particular crimes are likely to occur and about who is likely to be involved either as a victim of the crime or a perpetrator of the, the crime. So this is what a colleague of mine referred to as sort of the holy grail of policing. Can we stop, uh, stop violence and crime before it happens? So the inputs into these algorithms include things you might expect, things like location, dates, times, uh, types of past crimes that have occurred on particular city blocks, but also neighborhood features and things like cycles of the moon, uh, how dark or light is it out? Um, are there big home football games? So things you wouldn't necessarily anticipate. And there are two categories of use here. So one is um, these systems help describe specific geographic locations that the police might want to go to. That is specific city blocks, right? It's really down at a grand granular level. And the police department will then decide, well, we're going to send you know, this team out on patrol in these city blocks at this time. Um, they were, these algorithms were also used to help identify specific people who might be involved in violence. And famously, the Chicago Police Department um, developed what it called a strategic subject list. So it identified uh, about 1,400 names of people who they thought were going to be most involved in violence uh, based on reported gang affiliations, criminal records, and so on. Turns out the uh, Chicago police have just shut this down. Um, so uh, that's something to keep in, keep, keep in mind as we're thinking about how the military might translate some of these things. So let me turn now to the military use of predictive algorithms. Um, uh, it occurred to me that the militaries are basically facing similar problems to the US criminal justice system here in that they need to predict how dangerous any particular person is, including people they have already detained. Um, during an armed conflict and also trying to predict the location of violent actors. So just to be clear, as a caveat, I'm not suggesting that militaries are going to start to let predictive algorithms make detention and targeting decisions autonomously, at least not yet. Um, but I am envisioning that these predictive algorithms are going to provide important inputs to the commander's decision about what to do um, with regard to targeting and detention. Why do I think this is potentially going to come down the pike? Well, part of it is based on conversations I've had uh, with people in the military. I used to be in government um, for about 10 years at the State Department. So um, talking to military people, uh, but also, as we all know, that uh, China and the US are pretty firmly committed to the role of AI, including in the military space, um, with China seeing uh, AI as a, as a race that it needs to win. Uh, and I think you, you all know on this, on this conversation more than I do, some of the possible advantages that could flow uh, from the use of uh, machine learning here, including accuracy, 
the ability to spot patterns that people themselves um, can't, and identifying interactions between different factors uh, in a way that humans uh, can. Okay, so how would we think about uh, the use of predictive algorithms by the military in these two settings, in the detention setting and the targeting setting? In the detention setting, in recent conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq, the US collectively detained over 150,000 people. So the N is pretty big there. And part of what they have to do is decide which individuals to hold for the medium term, the long term. They have an obligation to do this under the Geneva Conventions and other laws of war. So there are sort of legal pressures to, to do this. And so as with the criminal justice system, they're trying to predict future dangerousness in the face of imperfect information. So one of the things I explore in my paper is, you know, could the US create these kind of uh, predictive algorithms for this setting? Um, and some of the things I talk about are how it could be particularly challenging at the beginning of a conflict where you have limited information about the people you're detaining, the population. You don't know much about the characteristics of past detainees because you haven't had that many of them. Um, but as the conflict progresses, um, states are going to have more information about tribal relations, about neighborhoods, about loyalties, enemy tactics. They'll have more information about recidivism. Um, and I think the machine learning tools might help the US government identify unseen patterns and connections uh, among people they've detained. I also think the that the military is starting to use predictive algorithms for, uh, to help guide locations of violence, help them predict that, right? Recall the predictive policing model in the criminal justice system. Military has to decide, where should we send out a military to patrol uh, in a given time frame? Where should we anticipate the next attack coming from? And which actors are most likely to pose a threat during this deployment? So two related categories of action here, I think. One is choice about where to patrol, and the other is a choice about who to target because they pose an imminent threat of an attack to your forces. So uh, the US used a kind of rudimentary system like this in Iraq in 2006, where they um, used a system to try to help anticipate where insurgents were planting uh, improvised explosive devices. But I can imagine machine learning systems, for example, that help detect that the change in a number of, of tweets uh, in a particular time frame has tended to suggest that there's going to be an attack in a market uh, three hours later. Um, or changes in foot traffic that are identifiable by algorithms uh, set up on video cameras can also help predict uh, that there's a, an, an impending attack. Uh, couple of possible fit pitfalls uh, of predictive algorithms in, the, in this space. Well, I'll start by just thinking about what are the pitfalls in the criminal justice space and how they might map on to, uh, to the military setting. These criminal justice algorithms have faced a lot of, um, of, of critical writing, both in the legal space and also in the sort of sociological space. And I think some of these pitfalls will be exacerbated in the military space. So quantity and quality of data. Uh, do these things actually even work? Um, there was an academic study that looked at a bail algorithm that had been created using 500,000 cases in New York City, de uh, defendants arrested over five years, a lot of high quality data because they knew a lot about each of those people. They knew where they lived, they knew their marital status and so on. Um, I think it will be rare to have that kind of quality data to train in the military setting, especially at the beginning of the conflict. You need to rely on your military staff to collect the right data that the, the computer scientists are going to use. That data collection may not be their highest priority when they're on the battlefield, so you might end up with partial and therefore misleading data. Um, and it's also hard to get to the bottom of the, that level of granular data that we might have in our criminal justice system. Right, where we're not, we're dealing in a cross-cultural situation and we don't have a lot of existing databases on which to draw. Uh, we all know about biases in data, right? If the input data is biased, the output will be biased. In the military context, you can imagine it's easy to build in cultural biases as you're sort of training these algorithms because you might think, for example, people who, hold, who have guns are likely to pose a big threat to us, um, but maybe in Yemen, 90% of men uh, over the age of 10 carry guns, right? So you'd have to make sure you are not building in cultural biases. 
lack of transparency about how the bottle operates, criminal, criminal defendants uh, have been denied access to the, kind, the contents of these bail algorithms or sentencing algorithms, um, even when they've been brought to court. You can imagine how hard it will be for people on the receiving end of US algorithms. So, you know, the average guy in the, in the streets in Yemen who gets detained, uh, very hard to imagine how that person could challenge the use of the algorithm or the contents of the algorithm. And yet, I do think on this front, the, our military is going to demand a level of transparency uh, before deploying these algorithms. And you've seen DARPA do um, a fair amount of work on explainable AI. So I think that's a, a sort of positive development. Um, oversight and accountability challenges have been uh, flagged in the criminal justice system including you know, what happens if a judge uses a flawed algorithm, who's to blame? Is it the judge? Is it the state government that's given the judge the authority to use it? Is it the programmer of the system or so on? Um, and you can imagine how those translate into the military setting as well. Automation bias, uh, I think we've seen that in the, in the judge setting where judges are willing to assume that quantitative methods are superior to the judge's ordinary reasoning even if the judge has 20 years of experience, uh, we'll sometimes defer to these kinds of algorithms. Um, quite likely to see the same bias in the military setting uh, where there's even increased time pressure and there's a fair, fair amount of familiarity with, uh, with technology uh, among our military officials. So I conclude the paper by talking about uh, sort of a normative way forward and I talk about trying to open the black box a little bit. So, uh, many of you may recall that there was a deep secrecy about the US government's military and intelligence operations in the wake of the 9-11 attacks. And those tools that we used faced very harsh spotlight when they were finally revealed. Um, national security operations in this country are very hard to oversee, hard for Congress to oversee them, hard for the courts to oversee them. And the use of machine learning algorithms in this military and intelligence setting is really doubling down on the opacity of the system. So I'm starting to think about um, what I'm calling a double black box, of the black box of national security exacerbated by the black box of some of these tools. So I think the US military should go on a transparency offensive here. And by that, I don't mean that the military should reveal the contents of each algorithm that it's using, but I do think it means things like explaining what laws apply, how it is that the algorithms they're using will be consistent with international law, um, what advantages these algorithms serve, and then being honest about what challenges the military is confronting and how they plan to address them if they're going to use these systems. So I'll stop there. Okay, hey, uh, thank you, Ashley. Uh, we, we have um, some time for questions. Uh, please just uh, interject now, ask them directly, or if you feel more comfortable, just use the chat function. I'm particularly interested if people have thoughts about whether um, these systems are going to be uh, incredibly hard to develop such that our military is sort of barking up the wrong tree, um, or if there are parallel things out there that uh, suggest this is right around the corner. So um, anyone with a sort of tech background on this who has thoughts, I'd really welcome reactions. So I, I don't know if someone else has their hand up, but I'm Allison, um, Allison Booth. I, I just was feeling like this is, this is where suddenly um, you really need some humanists. <laughs> you know, calling all people who know the first thing about the culture that uh, we're encountering in a military way, because uh, the completely skewed data you might get from all kinds of quantitative sources, uh, if you don't happen to know anything about the, the local religion or, you know, things happen, you know, always happen on a Thursday afternoon in this town. I mean, you just, anyway, it's, it's, it's a nightmare to think about the deployment of predictive um, technologies when you don't, when the data is flawed. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so that's a nice point. And, and it's particularly true if you're trying to develop an algorithm about uh, sort of detention dangerousness and you use that algorithm across conflicts, right? Each, each algorithm is going to have to be quite tailored to a conflict and maybe also tailored within a conflict. So if you think about in, in Iraq, at one point we were fighting Saddam Hussein's military, then we started fighting the Mahdi army, then we started fighting Al Qaeda in Iraq. Those are very different actors who pose, who have very different threat levels and understanding each of them uh, is complicated. So these wouldn't be algorithms that you could just drop in uh, on any particular uh, uh, set of detainees. So I agree with that point for sure. So Jack, could you say a little bit more about your point? I wonder about the resurgence of area studies in the age of machine intelligence. Yeah, absolutely. And this follows on Allison's point, actually, you know, thinking about the necessity to learn languages, um, to uh, have you know, knowledge of the cultural context, which you actually mentioned yourself, right, Ashley. And so, um, you know, area studies, at least in the humanities, has been, has been kind of, um, uh, it's been problematized in the, as, as a kind of a Cold War construct of how the geopolitical sort of landscape of uh, university work, uh, you know, is sort of laid out. And, and I do wonder whether or not, you know, with this sort of increasing, I mean, there are interesting ways in which the militarization of the humanities might take place, right? And this would be one of them. I don't, you know, necessarily think this is a great thing, <laughs> but, but it, you know, does direct funding. And, you know, one of the things that all of us are concerned about is how funding is going to flow, right? Um, you know, in the age of uh, algorithmic sort of cultures and machine intelligence. Yeah, so especially as um, we're seeing the hollowing out of like the foreign service, uh, which would be, you know, the, the foreign service is often there on the ground with the military, even if they're not fighting on the battlefield. And one of the key things they do is they often have great language skills and they often have a deeper understanding of the culture and the interlocutors. Um, and as that's falling away, that's, that's a challenge. I do know that the, the Defense Department itself uh, tries to train up experts in both the language side and the cultural side. Um, but that's not their, their raison d'etre, right? That is the reason that the State Department exists. So I do worry about that too. Um, Dan, I think you had a question. Okay, I had to unmute, sorry about that. Um, so you mentioned that some of the output to these algorithms are coming into the courtroom and judges t tend to pay special attention to them. What, so I'm wondering, what does this look like? So I'm a statistician and I'm wondering, are they reported with like probabilities or do they just say, you know, this person was targeted? Um, yeah, so what? what uh, yeah, so um, one of the main systems that's been used is a, a system called Compass. Um, and it, uh, Compass has refused to reveal the contents of its algorithm because it claims uh, trade secrets. So that's about kind of what is the system doing behind the veil. Um, but I think what the, what the government is seeing, or the prosecutors, is they're, they're, they clump people into categories. So I think you get ranked on a scale of one to 10 in terms of your, your level of dangerousness, where a one through a three is kind of low risk, you know, four to seven is medium risk, and eight and higher is, is high risk. Um, so it's, it's a, um, and I don't know whether that includes confidence levels either. Um, uh, and because Compass successfully invoked this trade secrets argument in one of these cases that went to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, um, uh, and the court said, uh, you know, the, it was okay that the judge used the system. Uh, we're not gonna, it's not a violation of due process that we don't show it to the defendant because we don't really think that was the only thing the judge was basing his decision on. That actually got appealed to the Supreme Court, which denied cert, which said, so in other words, they weren't gonna take up that issue. Um, but you know, I, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting question, and, and especially as these things get more sophisticated, um, how the information is presented to the judge is gonna be important, right? Um, Uh, Anton. Oh, uh, Ashley, sorry, we, oh, we are on a very okay. tight schedule here, so yeah, nice. gracefully uh, uh, postponed his question. So, um, 
Thank you very much for a great talk. And um, Vicente, would you like to uh, introduce Anton? Uh, yes, sure. So our next speaker is uh, Professor Anton Korinek. He's a professor here in economics. I guess we know him already, but uh, he's going to give us the next presentation. Thanks. Uh, please uh, okay. take it over. Thank you very much, uh, Vicente, for the kind introduction. Um, I am going to share my uh, slides with everyone uh, because uh, one of the things that we can see in these interdisciplinary events is that there is vastly varying conventions as to whether you're expected to prepare slides or not. And in economics, you usually always prepare ones. <laughs> so I will speak about AI and the future of work. And I want to start by really addressing this fundamental question. Uh, what are the effects of technological progress on the economy? And um, if we uh, rewind uh, backwards by a couple of centuries, uh, we know that there has been uh, a story that has been termed the Luddite story. Uh, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, uh, there was a great deal of anxiety uh, especially among artisan weavers and spinners who lost their jobs at the time to the mechanization of the textile industry. Now, you can still hear the Luddite story quite a bit these days. Uh, whenever there is new innovation, you hear people who are concerned about jobs being destroyed. But of course, nowadays, and I'm saying 2019 because I'm hoping that the consensus is slowly shifting, we have a, a much better story for what happens when there's technological progress. Let me call that the smart consensus story. So what does this smart consensus among much of the elite, uh, probably around the world, say? It claims that, well, the way that technological progress works is that we automate away old, uh, low-paying, uh, unproductive jobs, and we create new, higher-paying, much more exciting jobs. And well, along the way, there is unfortunately some transition costs. There are people who lose their jobs, who have to retrain, who have to find new jobs. But you know, that's worth uh, taking on, because ultimately, a rising tide lifts all the boats. So that's been more or less the story that people have been telling among the informed elite about how technological progress affects the, the economy. Well, let me actually go into an aside now. Uh, when you listen to public discussions about the effects of technology on the job market, uh, people oftentimes focus on the number of jobs that are created or lost. Uh, but this is really not a very good indicator for labor market conditions. What economists prefer to focus on is we prefer to look at the level of wages. And the reason for that is simple. So since most people try to find work no matter what, you find that employment always stays roughly speaking, very roughly speaking, around some full employment level. And um, where you really see the uh, results of fluctuations in labor demand is in the level of wages. Uh, the technical language that economists use to describe this phenomenon is to say labor supply is pretty inelastic. Labor supply is almost constant. So no matter what the level of wages are, the vast majority of people try to work uh, regardless of that. And uh, when there is fluctuations in demand, when there is changes in demand, uh, the result of that is if you have pretty constant supply and changes in demand, you will see that wages go up when there's an increase in labor demand or wages go down, uh, but you don't actually see the level of employment fluctuate all that much. So let me show you uh, one of our favorite tools in economics, which is a demand and supply diagram to illustrate that. On this diagram, you see on the uh, vertical axis, the level of wages, and on the horizontal axis, the level of employment. 
And there are two types of curves. The curve that's labeled S and that is almost vertical is the supply curve. And the fact that it's almost vertical captures that if you change wages, if you go up or down in this diagram, the amount of labor that we people are willing to supply uh, doesn't really change very much. Uh, as a first approximation, uh, working age people who are not studying try to find a job, uh, or I should say perhaps working age people who are not studying or not home caring for loved ones try to find a job. On the other hand, the demand curve, which is this downward sloping curve of which there is actually two versions, uh, is what economists call relatively elastic. So that means that as you change the wage level, as you go uh, up or down in this diagram, you can see that the quantity of labor demanded is high for, uh, for high wages, so, sorry, is low for high wages and high for low wages. In other words, the more expensive workers become, the less companies are willing to employ them. And that relationship is clearly downward sloping in the data. So if you look at changes in demand, which means we shift this curve, uh, in this particular example, you can see from the arrows, I've shifted the curve upwards and outwards. What you get is if you have increased demand and outward shift in demand, uh, wages, if you go from equilibrium E0 to E1, rise quite significantly, but the quantity of labor changes almost insignificantly. So in some ways, what I have drawn here, that labor demand increases, is kind of uh, the way that uh, we have generally viewed the effects of technological progress on the economy. And if we go back 200 years to when we were in the midst of the Industrial Revolution, then it's probably fair to say that labor demand has risen a lot since then. And uh, therefore, wages have gone up by quite a bit almost 20 fold uh, in the countries at the frontier. Now, however, what's the truth? So um, we have seen more and more that this uh, simplified story that a rising tide lifts all boats does not quite capture reality. So the truth is that new technology always leads to significant redistributions of income. Moreover, new technologies can be either labor using or neutral or labor saving. And if they are labor saving, they actually reduce labor demand, reduce wages and reduce employment by a little bit. So for any particular technology, and of course our discussion today is mainly about AI, but this is true for any technology, we don't always know in advance what the effects uh, on the labor market will be, but frequently we have a hunch. And um, the last point I want to make, and I will illustrate that with a couple of diagrams in the following slides, is that so far automation and most of the applications of AI that we have seen seem to have hurt lower skilled workers, seem to have reduced demand for lower skilled workers. So um, if we have an innovation, that means the economy can suddenly produce more, but one set of people have actually been hurt by that innovation. It means that there must be some other set of people who have gained more than the losses of those who have been hurt. And um, let me maybe jump directly to the data slide in the interest of time. So if you look at the right hand diagram here, uh, that diagram shows you the income share of the top 1% and of the top 0.1%. So the blue line is the top 1%, the orange line, the top 0.1%. What you can see is the so-called superstars of the economy, the highest earners have really increased their share of the total output produced by the economy. So the top 1% have doubled the share of what they take home the top 0.1% have tripled it. At the same time, the labor participation rate of the economy and the overall share of income that goes to labor 
has uh, declined significantly in the past, roughly speaking, four decades. So the labor share is how much of the total amount of output produced goes to pay workers as opposed to goes to pay for capital. And that has declined from, this is the orange right-hand scale now, from roughly two thirds half a century ago to something like 57% at present. Uh, at the same time, you can also see that the fraction of people who have participated in the uh, labor force, and I should say this focus is now actually on male workers where you have seen these effects particularly starkly, has gone down from almost 98% to less than 90%. One more data slide which shows the change in people's earnings as a function of uh, time and broken out for different uh, levels of education. So what you can see here uh, on this slide is that if you have a graduate degree, that means if you are either uh, a man or a woman uh, uh, who is uh, depicted by this dark blue line here, then your uh, earnings have risen quite significantly over the past few decades. Uh, if you have only a bachelor's degree, not quite so much, especially for the men. Uh, if you have only some college or a high school uh, degree, then, well, your earnings have almost stagnated. And if you are a high school dropout, uh, and in particular, if you're a man, then the real income that you take home today is pretty much the same as was it has been half a century ago. So there have really not been any income gains for high school dropouts over the past half century, whereas the best educated have seen what they take home more than double. Now, so to kind of tell the overall story of this uh, just in three lines, since roughly speaking the 1970s, unskilled workers in the US have been left behind. Since roughly the 2000s, I haven't emphasized it on the slide before, uh, if you have only a college degree, the economy has also left you behind and uh, actually left you behind with increasing levels of debt. We don't really know what will happen after the 2020s, but um, let me maybe uh, use the words of uh, one of the Nobel laureates in economics who has spoken about kind of the long run direction of technological progress and what it means for workers. That was Vasily Leontiev, and he predicted that the role of humans as the most important factor of production, uh, as basically uh, the suppliers of labor, uh, where labor played this really central role in our economy, is bound to diminish. And the way he put it is he said it's bound to diminish in the same way that the role of horses in agriculture was first diminished and then eliminated by the introduction of tractors. So if we have that perspective, and I should say uh, history is yet to be written, then the implications for labor are pretty bleak. So what can we do? And this is my concluding slide now. Uh, what you often hear, and I label it the easy way, although of course it is by no means easy, uh, but what we often hear is that uh, when people are presented with these um, uh, statistics, they advocate more redistribution. This is perhaps nowhere more, more fashionable than in Silicon Valley, where something like, for example, the UBI, a universal basic income, is all the rage. And if you think of it, uh, if we did indeed have a UBI in some distant technological future where everything in the economy uh, may be accomplished by robots, then we really wouldn't have to worry about the distribution of income. Now, one caveat that I want to note here is that in reality, the opposite has actually happened in recent decades. And one possible explanation is that as workers, uh, and in particular lower skilled workers in recent decades, have um, 
lost uh, uh, wages, they have also lost some of their bargaining power, uh, not only within their corporations, but also in the political process. Workers as a whole just aren't as powerful anymore as they used to be. And that's why, uh, at least according to some uh, theories, uh, we have seen a reduction in redistribution and changes to our social systems have actually exacerbated the inequality that has been generated by the market system. Now, a second story on which I want to focus now is to not focus on redistribution, but instead on pre-distribution. So then the question becomes, uh, pre-distribution asks how we can affect the structure of the economy in a way so that workers can continue to earn a living wage. And one of the um, assumptions behind that is that the direction of technological progress is not a given, but progress depends very much on human decisions, depends on decisions where, how much, and how quickly to innovate, at least for now, that we humans are in control. So my appeal uh, to, to uh, basically the AI sector is we really need to steer technological progress so as to enhance labor, and in particular lower skilled labor, rather than replacing it. We need more distribution aware AI research and we need more distribution aware uh, AI entrepreneurs because I believe that that's our best hope for steering towards the future where everybody can earn a living wage as opposed to humanity following the fate of horses in agriculture. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Anton. Um, just to remind you, if, if you'd like to ask questions, we've got um, somewhere around 10 minutes to do that. Um, either use a chat function or signal. Um, Anton, could you drop the slide so we can go back to... Yes, speak? let me do that. And Vicente, would you like to um, moderate the questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, please uh, enter your questions on the chat or just... Um, so, Zachary, I see, I see that you're raising your hand, so maybe you, we can start with your question. Go ahead, please. Yeah, that's great, Anton. Um, so I'm wondering where like a third strategy falls in the redistribution versus pre-distribution angle, right? So one thing you could do is you could just slow, for example, um, the development of, uh, or the introduction of artificial intelligence into manufacturing. So people keep the same kind of jobs that they had before. I mean, the other thing you might do is just like say, hey, look, we have a lot more money. We'll, uh, we'll tax uh, people who are winning from artificial intelligence and put money into bureaucracy, for example, right? Um, and so it's not redistribution per se because you're not having universal basic income, but you could just have it so that like, you know, if you go to the DMV, it takes an hour. And if you, um, which like, I mean, it sounds funny, but I think it would be like a huge difference in people's lives if they were interacting with bureaucracy in a way that uh, it just functioned properly and it was massively funded or teachers like every class could have 15 students uh, in elementary schools. And those seem like jobs that humans, at least for now, are, uh, are well, I guess maybe not the DMV, but the, I mean, so one thing you might do is just distribute the, the kinds of jobs from the manufacturing sector where tech is just more efficient um, to redistribute those efficiency gains to build up bureaucracy. And I'm just not sure where that falls in the pre-distribution versus redistribution um, dichotomy, or if it's just something else. Uh, yeah, that's a great point, Zach. And uh, I'm actually completely with you on that. Uh, and you know, when we speak of technology, uh, the first thing we usually think of is high tech. Uh, but the way that economists mm -hmm. think about technology is that it includes, for example, the ways that we are teaching people or the way that the DMV processes data. So all this is actually part of technology. And I think uh, what you just described is actually a way of um, allocating more labor into sectors uh, where they really can play an important role and where they are nowadays still far superior to machines. So yeah, I would strongly 
uh, advocate your proposal to, to essentially channel more workers into those labor intensive sectors because ultimately that's also uh, going to be what increases overall labor demand in the economy and what makes sure that advances in uh, any kind of technology leads to more broadly shared progress. Okay, thanks. Uh, Fiona has a question too, so uh, hey. go ahead. Thanks, Vicente. Anton, I enjoyed your talk very much and it made me think about the gig economy um, mm -hmm. and the use of algorithms right now to distribute labor opportunities. And Instagram, oh sorry, Instacart has emerged as a really key example for sociologists who study this and the potential for um, unfairness. I'm thinking here about recent Trump administration decisions about gig workers being independent contracts rather than employees with a long standing relationship to um, a source of labor and therefore wages. Um, so I guess my question really is how much of what you said um, can we use to be thinking about the gig economy and what might algorithms be doing better to support those workers? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think the gig economy uh, is a really interesting example of those types of uh, new technologies that actually do create jobs. But at the same time, when we say that, I think it gives us all some heartburn because we know that the jobs it does create are not necessarily the best ones. Uh, so as an economist, let, let me be completely honest and let me uh, underline that there is actually a very positive aspect to these platforms. They really do create more jobs and that in itself is really desirable. But I think what it really underlines is that um, technology is only one role, uh, but play, plays only, is only one factor in the distribution of income and our institutions are a very important second factor. And um, the types of rulings that you just described, Fiona, uh, really don't help to ensure that these jobs also get fair pay. So what I, as an economist, would advocate is let's try to have as many Instacarts as possible, but at the same time, let's make sure that these jobs uh, face uh, regulations that make sure that they are paid fair wages, that they have uh, fair benefits, and that they face decent working conditions. I think that's the way that I would think about it. Thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, if there are no more questions, then maybe we can we can move to the next session. Thanks, uh, Anton. I see there's two questions in the chat, but I don't know which end if we have time. Uh, yeah, I think we, we you might have to take that offline. Okay. Um, all right, so we are going to the next session, and next session is Dan Spitzner from the Department of Statistics, and he's a professor also at UVA. So please uh, take it away, Dan. Oh, you're you're on mute, so unmute yourself. Oh. Yeah. It's the third time I've done that. I apologize again. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I have some. I, I'm doing something a little different. I actually wrote out my talk, which I rarely do, but uh, I also have slides. So. Can, can everyone see my slides? Yes, we can see them. Okay, I'm gonna... We can see your whole desktop, by the way. Yeah, I wanna, how's that? Yes, it looks, it looks good. Okay, great. So socially inclusive foundations of statistics. Several years ago, I gave a presentation to the Human and Machine Intelligence Group entitled, Why Analyze Data? Um, during which I looked beyond the methodology of statistical analysis toward the diversity of reasons why data are analyzed in the first place and what the goals are of such analyses. That presentation was my first semi-successful attempt to organize and give form to ideas that had been percolating in my mind for quite a number of years. I've since written a paper, soon to be published, that draws from the same inspiration as my previous presentation, but fleshes out its ideas by a different route it is the basis of my remarks today. 
So in this work, I explore the phenomenon of alignment between practice and worldview and the possibility that practices may be realigned. Specifically, my topic is the possibility to detach statistical practice from its traditional pairing with a positivist type scientific worldview and to become realigned with a worldview that emphasizes community and social responsibility. In this effort, I am inspired by the feminist, by feminist and decolonization scholars and others who criticize the scientific worldview for its emphasis on control and for its exclusionary effects. I am drawn instead to a worldview that underlies participatory, emancipatory, partnership, and user-led research, and other approaches that collectively form what has come to be known as socially inclusive research, whose goals attend to such notions as unity, cohesion, civic engagement, togetherness, and bridging the gap between us and the other. My ultimate interest is in the development of statistical methodology. To that end, I, my hope is that this work will ignite creativity, enhance the diversity of people and ideas within my discipline, and open new opportunities for collaboration with other disciplines. Building on the theme of community, I adopt in this work the perspective that knowledge is made meaningful through a social process. I hope to draw out in this talk the potential of this idea for guiding the development of statistical methodology. The name I give to this process is community elicitation. Here, the term elicitation echoes a foundational idea in Bayesian analysis, a prominent mode of quantitative inquiry. By that approach, data, data analysis is a multi-step process. It begins with a probabilistic statement of what is already known, it then looks to newly measured data and applies a mathematical result known as Bayes' theorem to update that knowledge. In this way, Bayesian analysis is a story of transformation. Prior knowledge it, that, that gathered at the start of inquiry is transformed into posterior knowledge. Elicitation refers to the problem of bringing forth knowledge and it is particularly associated with the elicitation of prior knowledge. A rich set of theories has developed around the elicitation problem, along with a lengthy body of criticism. As it is traditionally conceived, Bayesian elicitation is individualistic in the sense that knowledge is taken to reside in individuals, specifically in the minds of experts. Its accompanying theories borrow heav heavily from economic abstractions and carry a strong positivist flavor. In contrast, community elicitation offers an alternative viewpoint by which knowledge resides in community. These two versions of elicitation contrast in a number of, of other important ways. For one, they draw support from contrasting pers perspectives on the nature of human thought. Traditional Bayesian methodologists draw particular inspiration from psychological experimentation on human judgment of uncertainty. In the 1970s, research by Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman developed the viewpoint that when faced with uncertainty, people turn to approximate strategies that use only limited information, also known as heuristics, and that people, uh, people's assessments of uncertainty exhibit predictable violations of probability theory, also known as biases. This framework is used by Bayesian methodologists to define the goal of elicitation which is to reduce the bias when gathering knowledge from an expert. In contrast, as support for community elicitation, I look to a 2011 paper by cognitive scientists, Hugo Mercier and Dan Sperger, Sperber, who assert an argumentative theory of reasoning. This theory posits that reasoning has evolved and persists mainly because it makes human communication more effective and advantageous. Such a viewpoint contrasts with with what these authors describe as the classical view that the main function of reasoning is to enhance individual cognition and to correct the mistakes of intuition, a view that to me sounds a lot like the heuristics and bias framework. Importantly for community elicitation, the argumentative framework strengthens the notion that even isolated individuals are woven into the fabric of community. Whereas traditional Bayesian elicitation alludes to a process of eliciting knowledge from an expert's mind, the process of community elicitation plays out as a procession of arguments and counter arguments accompanied by proposed description of descriptions of knowledge, 
all of which move a community toward a larger description of what it knows. Methodologically, the goal of an individual researcher is to formulate an argument in support of a proposed description of knowledge, which could rest on sources other than experts, such as existing literature, and would acknowledge a range of influences from the researcher's community. The distinct process and goals of community elicitation, as well as its broader scope, stands to offer a new and potentially helpful perspective around long-standing debates around probability and prior knowledge. It does not demand an entirely new methodology built from scratch, but instead motivates a re-examination and potential repurposing of traditional Bayesianism, Bayesianism's already extensive toolkit for elicitation. It seems to be a promising idea. I return now to my questions around the alignment of practice and worldview. These questions for me are manifestations of deeper personal wonderings from my journey as a statistician. My overarching interest is in the problem of statistical inference, which I would define today as a problem of making meaning out of data, out of, num of numerical data, I should specify. What I have come to learn about this problem is that traditional Bayesian reasoning is regarded as a normative theory of statistical inference, by which I mean to say that it passes a standard of rationality that qualifies it as a theory that should, I write that in quotes, it should guide statistical practice. However, statistical practice, especially in the United States, is dominated by an alternative mode of inferential thinking known as the frequentist approach. As a framework for statistical inference, Frequentism is well known to exhibit logical flaws, but it is nevertheless embraced for reasons that I interpret as, interpret as its consistency with the view of an inherent order within nature, or perhaps it is embraced out of pragmatism, a topic that I touch on later. Further complicating this picture, Bayesian methodologists have put forward analytically derived representations of prior knowledge that are purported to allow bypassing of the elicitation problem and in doing so incorporate traditional notions of objectivity into the Bayesian machinery. These methods have become enormously popular within Bayesian statistics despite accompanying theory that establishes such so-called objective Bayesian methods include, induce logical inconsistency and negate Bayesianism's claim to provide a normative theory. What I gather from this situation is that mathematical reasoning does not drive current day statistical practice. Instead, statistical practice is aligned with a positivist type scientific worldview whose tenets dictate what lines of supporting mathematical formulation are allowed to, fl to flourish. The, the question that I ask is whether this alignment is the only one possible. That is, is it possible to develop a sensible supporting formulation of statistical pra practice under the guidance of an alternative worldview? Or, to state the question critically, must it be the case that the only statistical methodology available, the only methodology that filters into our classrooms and training workshops, that is built into our statistical software packages and that influences the conventions of research, is methodology that developed under the guidance of a worldview that is noted for social irresponsibility? These questions have to do with the shaping of statistical practice, and to address them earnestly, I've begun a project with practically-minded goals. As a first step, I have sought to identify communities of researchers who seemingly implement statistical practice under a socially inclusive worldview. This has led me to become intrigued by mixed methods research, an approach that embraces intersection between qualitative and quantitative methodologies. The mixed methodologist Jennifer Green describes it as a form of inquiry that actively invites us to participate in dialogue, multiple ways of seeing and hearing, multiple ways of making sense of the social world, and multiple standpoints on what is important and to be valued and, ch and cherished. Due, part, due partly to the influence of qualitative perspectives, this way of doing research is sometimes practiced under a socially inclusive worldview. The discussions around mixed methods research are additionally interesting for addressing interpretive tensions that arise when attempting to co-mingle qualitative and quantitative methodologies. Within this debate, three positions draw notable attention. Number one, incompatibility. 
the view that qualitative and quantitative methods are inherently incompatible and cannot be integrated. Number two, the dialectical position, the view that qualitative and quantitative approaches can be put into dialogue while respecting their interpretive distinctions. And number three, integration under the cover of pragmatism. Among these, the pragmatist position is the one most widely adopted. It effect, its effects are worthy of closer examination. The particular flavor of pragmatism that is commonly adopted emphasizes expediency. It falls short of informing substantial decisions made during the course of research and is problematic for ostensibly hindering the extent to which mixed method studies integrate their constituent methodologies. Scholars have noted a common inclination for researchers to adopt a pragmatist stance not to deepen understanding or to harness the best of both worlds as, been, as has been touted as an advantage of mixed methods research, but to secure funding for their research interests and publish their findings. Others have noted that the rise of mixed methods research has marginalized qualitative research, while an effect of lack of integration having become accepted is that a majority of mixed method studies use the analytic and prescriptive style of positivism. Given this situation, my hope is that realigning statistical practice would enable greater integration in mixed method studies and consequently greater ease at which such studies may be practiced as socially inclusive research. As an alternative to the incompatibility, dialectical and pragmatist positions, I, propo I propose a fourth option, which is to translate the aims of qualitative perspectives into a vision for socially inclusive foundations for statistics. In other words, as strange as this may sound, the aim is to develop a class of statistical methodology that is customized for a qualitative mindset. The blueprint I offer is Bayesian statistics applied using community elicitation. Community elicitation is attractive to this context for reasons that I have already discussed. As for the Bayesian framework, I find that its emphasis on prior knowledge forms a bridge to qualitative methodologies through the latter's typical emphasis on positionality within the research context. For example, it would matter to context whether a health sciences study, say, aims to clarify aspects of a biomedical model or if its immediate applications are to clinical care. Noting these differences gives rise to questions about how the two positions interface in society and shifts perspective to a deeper level of meaning. When viewed as part of a, the larger task of compiling background information, gathering prior knowledge and uncovering positionality hold potential to inform each other and to set up a seamless integration of methodology. The second aspect of the methodology I envision is that it would use a revised form of statistical reporting, and this connects to Ashley's talk earlier. It would, it would use a revised form of statistical reporting that would avoid probabilistic abstractions that cast inquiry as a game of chance. To this end, I have written a separate paper on a reporting scheme that I call pool reduction. This formalize, formalizes an idea expressed in the law literature on evidence reporting. It is suitable for contexts where one would normally think to report a p-value, or I should say a Bayesian version of one. In a 2018 paper, the law scholar Bill Thompson illustrates the scheme's basic reasoning by asking the reader to consider a DNA profile that would be found in only one person in one million in the general population. He points out that in a nation as large as the United States, there are, there are likely to be over 300 people who share the one in a million DNA profile. It follows that any further reduction in the pool of potential DNA sources from 300 down to one would be determined by considerations beyond the material examined in forensic analysis. A point to contemplate from this example is that reporting one in a million odds is abstract and easily made meaningless, while reporting in terms of pool reduction reminds the reader of the responsibilities of decision-making and the actual stakes of inquiry. So I'm concluding now. 
Um, the success of the project I have started will ultimately be measured by the extent to which the methodology I envision is used, is used and found to be helpful within socially inclusive research. That remains to be seen. In the meantime, I aim to improve ease of access to Bayesian methodology, especially to lower level methods, lower level methods that would be used routinely, and also advanced techniques that would be applied in consultation with a statistician. I aim further to promote effective dialogue that would clarify qualitative understanding of statistical methodology and work toward collaborations that would manifest holistic understanding within a research team, as well as showcase the effectiveness of community elicitation. My hope is to offer those who practice under a socially inclusive worldview the opportunity to be discerning about the choice of statistical methodology and provide an option that would align with their research perspectives. And I will stop there. Thanks. So we're going to take questions now. So please raise your hand or write your question in the chat. Um, okay. I don't. I don't see any right now. So maybe I can. I can start with asking a question myself. Sorry, uh, is it, Zach has a question. Yeah, I see that he just raised a hand. Zach, do you, still have... you can go first if you want. No, go ahead. I've Thank already you. asked him. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm wondering if um, the positive program in experimental philosophy might um, be a really interesting analog to what you're doing with the community elicitation, which I think is fantastic. I think it's a super cool project. Thank you. Um, so in experimental philosophy, what um, some folks think is that by when, when you're doing conceptual analysis, like say you're trying to understand what self-control is, one way you can do that is you can like, you know, ask a bunch of philosophers, you can do some empirical research. Another way you can do that is actually just literally run experiments, sometimes actually statistically sophisticated experiments um, to try and see what ordinary people um, think that the concept of self-control is. Um, and one, if, you're, if you believe in the positive program in experimental philosophy, you think that doing that kind of research can actually give you some information about what this psychological category is. So like you can actually learn things in the world, uh, you can learn things about the world by learning how sort of like ordinary and lay people just think about the world. And so you have this whole, this whole discipline that has its own sort of methods that it's developed over the last like 10, 15 years um, to try and do something that looked really analogous to community elicitation. So I'm sort of curious about whether there is that analog there and then whether the sort of Bayesian methods that you're doing can, can maybe tell us a little bit about how you might elicit that information about lay, lay people's understanding of phenomenon to go and make inferences about the phenomenon themselves. Uh, whereas, uh, yeah, so I, there, cause there just aren't rigorous methods to do that in, in X5. Maybe, Maybe Bayesianism could give you um, a, a little bit of a better way to do that. Sure, sure. Well, um, I, mean, I guess some thoughts about your question is, um, I mean, I'm reminded of some of the literature that I've read is that people have, people have, have done um, qualitative research asking people, asking to understand what is the thinking behind research? Like, what do, you think about, what do people think about when they do research? What kind of attitudes do they bring to that? And that's, that's very interesting to me. And I would love to somehow find out about how people think about, uh, about um, quantitative research when they have a qualitative mindset. So I th that's perhaps similar to, to some of the things that you're, that you're talking about. Uh, but the other thing I wanna say is, I think what I'm interested in here is uh, developing some kind of routine methodology. So if someone is doing quantitative research with a qualitative mindset, what kind of, re what kind of statistical methodology that would they use? And so I have a, you know, a practical minded goal of like offering a type of met methodology that perhaps they would be comfortable with using. I don't know, does that get at what you're, what you're asking? Yeah, maybe. Uh, although, I mean, two things. One is that there's, there's a difference between doing qualitative research on how ordinary people think about research and doing qualitative research on how ordinary people think about the very same phenomena that scientists are studying, right? So what experimental, the positive program in experimental philosophy says, you can learn stuff not just about research, but you can learn stuff about, you know, things in the world, like self-control by doing this sort of, like by looking at um, this sort of elicitation 
So I guess that's, I, I should probably stop though, because I want to ask. Sure, want, sure, that's fine. But again, what, what I'm after here is community, community elicitation as a, just as a way of doing research, like generally. Right. Right. And in fact, I see it as not something that's very far off from what we already do, which is when we do research, we start by collecting a bunch of background information. When we write a paper, we're really making an argument and then people argue back with us. So I, I see it as something that's not very, that's not very specialized at all, at all. It's something that we actually re already do. Uh, okay, thanks. So maybe I can ask a quick question. I mean, you had some argument about why people might be preferring frequent, frequentist approaches versus Bayesian. So, sure. um, do you think there is um, more to that? I mean, then yes. Uh, I, well, I don't know. I'm kind of speculating. I think there are a couple angles to it. Um, one is that there might be some kind of way of seeing the world that's involved, something that's like deeply personal and, and deeply philosophical, which ha could, could have to do with, you know, I think the world looks this way and frequentism seems to match the way that I think it would work. But I think the other side to it is that frequentism was what's there. You know, it's all around and I have to get this work done. So I'm just going to do this because that's the way that, that it gets the work done. So that's a, a pragmatist, pragmatist point of view. So there are a couple different angles to it that I, that I touched on, but sure, you could, you could go a lot, lot further with it. All right, thanks. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, Paul, do you want to take this take over? Um, sure. So we're, uh, we're, we're pretty much out, out of time, uh, in fact. So uh, thanks to all the uh, speakers. And as a mark of how successful this was, everybody who logged it on is still here. <laughs> <laughs> Very unusual, as you know, for a Zoom conference. So that's uh, that's great. So uh, Ashley, Anton, and Dan, thanks very much. For sure, time. my pleasure. Okay, uh, Jack, do you want to just uh, sum up? Okay, I guess. Um, thank you, everyone. This is really a wonderful, informative uh, meeting session. Um, looking forward to the next one. Um, it's on the IHGC calendar, so keep your eye out for that. Um, so we have three more panels coming up, uh, and they will run through the end of September. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing some of you there, hopefully, and I'm looking forward to the continued success of HMI, which is just a wonderful group. Thank you so much, Paul and Vicente. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Yes. Thank you.